while back I had some stuff to take care of up in Seattle, Washington. And since I was in the Pacific Northwest, I went to visit Adrian Black. I'm sure you already are watching his channel, and if not there will be a link below. And you should definitely check it out if you're into vintage computers. So Adrian kindly enough offered me a broken Commodore 64 to repair on my channel. And I got to pick one out from the stack. This one says blue and garbled. That's interesting. So blue, blue and garbled. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I think we're gonna go with that one. Okay. You can find a link to that repair video in the description below. That Commodore had a rather silly behavior with the graphics. And we had some fun repairing it. I'm not gonna spoil that video if you haven't seen it yet. Check out the link below if you haven't, after you have watched this video. And in addition to that Commodore, Adrian also gave me a spare board. And that's what we are going to try to fix today. So this board was actually working when he gave it to me. But fortunately it didn't survive the trip back home. I had it in my carry-on bag in an antistatic bag. So I'd say it was properly taken care of. But apparently that wasn't enough. We're also going to try out a new toy for my Retrobride process because I think we might need it for this project. So let's flip that power switch and see what we're up against. But before we do I'd like to thank our sponsor PCBWay. Aside from making excellent PCBs, they also do CNC machining, sheet metal fabrication, 3D printing and injection molding. Check out their shared projects page where you will find some really cool projects for your vintage PC. Get an instant quote now at pcbway.com. Okay, let's see what went wrong with this board on the flight back home. Well, I think we have some kind of signal. It was like a white stripe just flashing by and there it came again. So it looks like it's trying to boot and fails. I'm skipping ahead here, but I think there's about 20 seconds between those lines showing up on the screen. And now it flashed a black screen. So that's a pretty weird behavior for a Commodore 64. Never had this before. I'll try to reboot the machine a few times and see what happens. And we're getting the same result on the second attempt. And now we have a line to the right. And it stays on. I guess I'll do a few reboots. And now it's back to flashing a white line on the left side of the display. Yeah, definitely something weird going on here. I'll keep turning the power on and off to see if we get any different behavior. And the no signal text disappears every time I boot. So it's sending something to the display. Yeah, I'd say that's an almost consistent behavior. And this board is also going to need a case. And this is what I had in mind. So if you have watched that previous video, where we repaired Adrian's Commodore 64, you know that he has a Commodore 64 ZIF board in a spare VIC case. So I'm thinking that this nasty yellow spare VIC case should be a perfect match for this project. There is a problem however, it looks absolutely nasty. This case is disgusting and it has yellowed pretty badly. So what I'm thinking here is, while we try to repair that board, I'll retrobrite this case and hopefully it will look nice by the time we have repaired that board. And in an attempt to make my retrobrite process a bit quicker, I picked one of these from Amazon. And this is a full spectrum grow light. Suitable for all stages of plant growth. Now hopefully the Commodore won't grow. But what I am hoping for is that it will make the retrobrite process much quicker. And it's supposedly a 2000 watt unit. And I don't believe that for a second. But I did turn it on and it's extremely bright. So there's definitely some serious power coming out from this UV light. And this is how I'm going to go about this whole project. So this is my good old... UV box and I've been using it for quite a long time and it's just a cheap plastic crate with some aluminium foil not sure how well the camera picks this up but I have glued some UV strips on the inside however I have done some experiments and turned those UV lights off and it didn't make any difference 
So these UV strips are completely useless. So what I'm gonna do is either to cut a big hole on the lid and then place this UV light on top. Or perhaps I'll make an attempt to mount it inside the lid instead. Maybe that's easier. Anyways, I'll put some peroxide cream on that case, put it in a box and turn that supposedly 2000 watt UV light on. And we'll see if that makes any difference. Alright, so we're back to a lot less dusty board. Let's try it out with the cartridge and see how it behaves. And it behaves exactly like it did before, so no change. Let's try it out with a dead test cartridge and see if it gives us any clues. Well, we have a similar behavior. Yeah, it behaves kind of similar, but every now and then we've got something that resembles one flash. Well, this is all we have to go by. So let's take a closer look at that board on the bench. Well, I'm not going to bore you with my cleaning process. But this case took some serious effort to clean up. But eventually I did get all the grime off. And it's still yellow, of course. But at least now it's clean. And it looks to be in a pretty decent condition. So this is what we're going to do. Our grow light has four screw holes at the back. So we're going to reuse them and I'm going to drill some holes in the lid. And this is the end result. And I'm quite pleased. This was a fairly simple and good fix. Although I don't know how much heat that will produce. So I guess I will be checking the temperature inside while we try this out. Okay, so let's give this a try in room temperature and see what kind of result we get after one hour. I'm not sure what the camera is going to make out of this UV light. But here in real life, it's extremely bright. Alright, so it's been an hour. And the temperature has risen from 20 Celsius to 25, almost 26 Celsius. So it does get warm, but nothing extreme. Perhaps even perfect. And I think it's time for a check. I better turn that off. Yeah, that is a lot of light. Probably pretty overexposed. And I can definitely see a change. Let me see if I can move in closer. Yeah, that case is definitely a lot less yellow. But it's not finished. And if I got my white balance settings correctly set on the camera, you should be able to see the difference too. And it's only been one hour, so that peroxide has not dried up, of course. So I think I'm just gonna put the lid back on and give it another hour. And we'll check on it again. And an hour has passed. So the VIC case has been inside this box for two hours in total. Let's take a look inside. Yeah, that is definitely looking better. I wonder if that case is finished. It might be. I'm gonna have to take a much closer look to see. Well, I checked and I think we have a small problem here. The aluminium foil isn't reflecting the UV light well enough, so the palm rest is slightly darker than the top part of the case. So I think the proper way to use this box now is to run it for a half an hour and rotate the case so it gets enough UV light from all sides. But I guess this also proves that UV light does make a huge difference. So let's try this and see what we get. And I hope we don't kill this case. And it's been 30 minutes. Time to check. And uh, that palm rest looks much better. But it's still not perfect. So I think I'm gonna put it on this angle here. And I'll give it 30 more minutes. And 30 more minutes. Let's check and see what we've got. Well, it looks much better. But it's really hard to tell if it's finished or not. I think it's slightly yellowed still. 
But I don't want to take any risks and destroy this case. So I'm gonna take it out and rinse it. And we'll see if it's finished or not. There's only one thing worse than a yellowed case. And that would be a case that has been destroyed in the RetroWrite box. So let's not take any chances here and clean it off. And make a thorough inspection. Okay, let's see what we've got here. Uh, let's remove that shield first. So we can inspect the board from the other side too. And a few of these tabs have already been desoldered. So someone has been doing something with this board prior to this repair. So let's toss this. Okay, what have we got? A 250407 board. And the SID chip and one of the CIAs. And one of the logic chips is in sockets. And I can see some flux residue on some of the RAM chips. Let's check the date codes. All the large chips are from early to mid 1983. Now let's check these RAM chips. 1984 and 1982. And these two chips are NSE branded. But the other chips are MOSTEC. So I'm pretty sure that this chip here and this one have been replaced at some point. And the dates on these MOSTEC chips are corresponding to the rest of the board. So I think we can say for sure that these two RAM chips have been replaced. Let's take a look inside the can. Let's remove that nasty paste and see what it says underneath. Week 27, 1983. And it's a 6567 R8. What else have we got? 1983, 83. Yeah, all the chips inside this can have corresponding dates too. So let's take a look underneath. And yeah, we definitely have some rework here. Aside from the usual hand soldered stuff, we have some things going on here. Yeah, I'll move the camera closer in. Yeah, so CIA 1 has clearly been replaced. I can't see any damage on the board. But the solder job isn't perfect either. But it's probably okay. Uh, then we've got that logic chip. I think it's the one in the socket. Let me check. Yes, it is. So it has been replaced too. And I can't see any damage to the board. It looks alright. And then we've got some flux on this RAM chip here. Let me see if that's one of those NEC chips. And it was, so how rude to replace RAM chips without using sockets. And I see something weird going on here. Yeah, it doesn't show up too well on camera, but these two legs here, they are not soldered. So whoever made this rework forgot to solder these two pins on this RAM chip. So that could possibly be our problem here. Let's see what else we've got. Yeah, everything else looks alright on this board. So I guess it only makes sense to start by soldering in these two legs. Before we do anything else. Yeah, let's try that. Yeah, I guess it's an easy mistake to make. If you're rushing things. So, now that's fixed. So, I guess we should make a quick test before we do anything else. Okay, let's see if we're lucky. Uh, no, we've got the same behavior as we had before. So, let's try something else. Well, the only two things we have to go by is what we had on the screen that sort of resembled a flash when we ran the dead test cartridge. And the fact that two of these 
RAM chips have been replaced. So I'm gonna put my bets on a bad RAM chip. And the Logic chips that is connected to the RAM chips are not MOS branded. They could of course be bad, but they are not high odds. So I'm gonna guess that we had one flash. And that indicates a bad U12. Since this is a Rev B board. So let's put that RAM chip in a socket. And we'll try the board out with another chip. Well, I don't know when manufacturers stopped using leaded solder. So I'm gonna add some fresh solder just in case to make the desoldering easier. And if you do, then of course, please share. Because if these boards have leaded solder, we can probably skip this step. Yeah, this is as easy as it looks. So I'm just gonna skip ahead here. Yeah, if you have watched my previous video, where we repaired a motherboard from 2006, then you can probably guess how much I'm enjoying how easy it is to remove components in Commodore 64s compared to more modern boards. Yeah, I think all the legs are freed up. Let's try to pull that chip. Yeah, nice and free. So easy. And all we need now is a socket. And as always, I'm gonna solder two of the legs. And make sure that socket is nice and flush before I solder the remaining legs. And that was the last leg. And since we have Adrian's Commodore on the bench, we might as well just swap the chips between the two. So I have replaced U13. Now let's see if that made any difference. And it didn't. So we still have the same behavior. So I think I'm gonna test that chip that we pulled in the other machine to see if it's actually good. So I put our suspect chip on this board now. Let's see how it behaves. And it's perfectly good, so nothing wrong with that chip. So what we saw before that resembled one flash was not one flash. So we've got something else going on here. And we don't really have any clues to what it might be. Well, in that case, I'm gonna go with the piggyback method. And see if we can get any clues this way. Same result. Now, this method doesn't always work. But it's definitely worth a try. Because the next step would be to put all those RAM chips in sockets. And even if we replace all the RAM chips, it could still be one of the logic chips. And I just realized that we forgot to do something. I didn't check if any of the chips are getting hot. So I'm gonna stop here and do a quick check. Now the weird thing here is that the board behaves like we have two different faults. Probably a RAM chip and then something is wrong with the graphics. And unfortunately nothing is getting really warm on the board. So no clues. I guess I'll just continue with the piggyback method and see if that gives anything. And unfortunately that method didn't give us any clues. So that was a dead end. Well, I'm getting a feeling that this board is trying to boot and for some reason it doesn't succeed but then it tries again so I wonder if we have a short on this board so next up I think we should remove the SID and the CIA and replace the VIC2 chip and see if that makes any difference because those chips are in sockets 
Okay, so CIA-1 and the SID chip are removed. And I have replaced the VIC-2 chip. Let's see how it behaves. Oh, I see. We did have two faults. Damn it. That was very unlikely, because this board worked just a few days before I tested it again. Back in my studio. And we're getting six flashes. Now, I did pull a couple of chips, so let's put one of them back to see which chip caused this problem. So, CIA-1 is back in its socket. And unfortunately, it behaves the same. And I say unfortunately because that was the least expensive chip. Let's get that SID back in. And let's try again. And that wasn't the problem either, so I guess that's a good thing, that we might actually have a good SID. Well, in that case, it has to be the VIC-2 chip. I guess we could try it out in the other board. And see if it prevents the other board to boot. Okay, so the VIC-2 chip is now in this working board. Let's give it a try. And we are getting a similar problem here, so... The no signal disappears, but then it comes back. So it's sort of trying to boot and fails. But then it seems to try again. So that was not great news. Those VIC-2 chips are hard to find nowadays. I guess we should try it with a dead test cartridge too, because I'm curious to see if we get a similar result. Okay, let's try that. And we are missing one of the RAM chips, and that is intentional, because I wanted to see if we got one flash. And I'm not sure we do, something flashes by, but it's so quick, I may slow it down in the edit. Yeah, I think we got one white line to the left. Well, then we know. And we still have a RAM issue on our board. Let's see how many flashes we had. Yeah, that's six flashes. Let me check what those are. And six flashes turned out to be U22. And that's actually one of those NEC chips that had been replaced. So I have replaced it with a socket and a working chip. Time for a test. Uh, yeah, that looks much better. And we obviously have the dead test cartridge in the slot. I guess we might as well let this run. And we've got a few faults. Okay, let's try this. Okay. Well, we've got all the text we should have on the display. And we do have a cursor too. Let's see if this board works. Yeah, the keyboard is working. And the characters seem to be fine too. Well, this is a pretty interesting machine. So, place your bets, and we'll try to fix it. At least, I haven't seen this fault before. Yeah, we better check the voltages before we move on. So, we've got 492 and 1187. Yeah, that's alright. And on the board, we've got 5 volts. Yeah, so voltages are okay. Well, with so many faults, I'm not sure where to start. So I'm gonna run the dead test cartridge a few times and see if it's consistent. And as you can see, it's behaving completely differently now. So everything was flashing and now it's solid black. But we still have the same errors. So we could either go with that color RAM or one of the RAM chips. I'll see if it's consistent first, before we move on. And now I actually think the board stopped running. Yeah, it's sort of consistent. We get the same errors, but it's changing colors. So now it's all green. I think we're gonna go for that color RAM first, before we try anything else. And this time it's sort of reddish. Yeah, this could be caused by one of many different things. So my gut feeling tells me it's the RAM, but at the same time, it's obviously the colors that are messed up, and we are getting an error for the color RAM. And now it's all green again. 
Yeah, it's very consistent, so I'm getting the same result over and over again, just in different colors. So I hope I have enough sockets to fix this board. And this is a tough call, but I'm gonna bet on the color RAM. Although I'm pretty sure I'm wrong. It's probably one of the RAM chips. So let me replace that color RAM and we'll see what results we get. Okay, so U6 is in a socket and I found a machine that has the color RAM in a socket. So let's try it out to make sure that chip is actually good. And it is. So let's put this chip in our board. And the color RAM is installed on the board. Fingers crossed. And no, it's still messed up. Now let's see if there's any difference whatsoever. And it's still showing up color RAM as bad. So I should have followed my gut feeling. There's nothing wrong with that color RAM. So I'm gonna go for U9 next. Lesson learned, always go for the gut feeling. And uh, now we've got some nice purple colors. And unfortunately, I just ran out of time, sockets and solder. So I'm stuck with this text flickering. And this is gonna have to be a two-part video. I have of course ordered some sockets and more solder. But next week I'm gonna have to find a project that doesn't require soldering. So I'll see what I can come up with. And today is actually the first day of 2023. So I'm going to end this video by wishing you all a happy new year. Thank you for watching, if you want to support this channel, like, subscribe, leave a comment and ring the bell below.